Well, morning everyone again. And it's been interesting in the last few weeks. As a council, we got together a few weeks ago and I love working with our leadership team. It's, it's such a good sense of team and community. And I started sharing a little something out of this book, Unfettered. And if you've been around me in the vicinity of four kilometers in the last few weeks, you will have heard me talk about this book because I'm loving it. But as, we, as I unpacked one story in it, we started talking about the themes that have come through our services in the last little while, the last six weeks or so. And we got on a roll. We started unpacking it and we actually started asking the question, what might God be saying to us? Or in God's style, what might he be whispering to us through our services on a Sunday? And it was a great lens through which to look. And, and as, we, as we unpacked it, we thought about... Um, Lisa's sermon, uh, which was a sharing time as part of her story. And she she talked about connecting with God through climbing a tree. We can't forget it now. It's a mantra. Climbing a tree, riding a bike, wind in my face. And so there was this childlike approach to God. Then the following week was Nick McKay. Now, if you weren't here for Nick, you really did miss a treasure, not only through his words, but he brought his kids with him and one of them, whose name I will not be able to pronounce, really co-preached with him. It was this wonderful um, moment of him sharing freedom of unity and how we approach God and, and it was wonderful, but his daughter was floating around the top here colouring and then she discovered that if she stood about there, she could make shadows appear on the data projector and she had a little top knot. So she was, she was like, this was joy. There was just joy in the room and it added, it didn't take away, it added to what he was preaching about. Then the next week we had Lindsay preach to us about God turning plan B into plan A. Does everyone remember that one? And he talked about the stress and the striving and all the feelings we get as we're trying to pursue a particular avenue. And then sometimes if we just sit back, we go, actually, I think God's got this. I really think God, God's got this. He can turn my plan B into a plan A. And he talked about the sense of um, just being able to rest in that, which was great. And as wonderful as all these speakers were, I think we'll all agree that the highlight, particularly over the last few weeks, has been listening to the kids tell us the kids' church stories, that they have been able to tell it in their own words, ask wild and crazy questions, and just enjoy the moment. So we sensed as we talked and unpacked this as a council that maybe God is saying something to us. Maybe, just maybe, he's inviting us, maybe we're invited by Jesus to have a childlike approach to the world. But it seems like a very, very strange and stupid, shall I say, idea to have this childlike approach to the world when the world is in so much trouble. And I, do I need to say it? Climate, politics, sexuality and gender, um, there's, there's, there's so much going on in the world and in your worlds, I know something of your worlds, I know they're not easy. So as things get more serious, doesn't it seem ridiculous to get more childlike? Maybe not. Who is Jesus? He's the one who turns everything on its head. Every time he got up to speak, he'd say things like, you've heard it said, but I say. And so I wonder whether strangely and almost mysteriously God is saying to us as individuals and as a church, the more serious the world gets, the more childlike I need you to be in your approach to me and to the world. I don't know, I, I, I've, got this, I've got this stress in my neck. <laughs> I know some of you have a lot of stress in your necks. But for a lot of us, each day brings heavy loads that are so tough to carry. And we end up sitting there at our computer desks doing this. And yet... We have this amazing story from Jesus that might be just speaking to us today. This idea of it being crazy to get more childlike as the world gets more serious. I'm going to take a couple of quotes from this book. There's a slide for this. It's Mandy Smith. She says, Western Christian study of God 
has largely looked like the work of lab technicians. We capture glimpses of this wild god and wrest them from their natural habitat into a sterile environment where we can slice them into tiny specimens. When we're done, we seal them up in little jars with little labels, satisfied with our tidy taxonomy, even if something had to die in the process. Sometimes that's how we approach faith. It's all in here. It's, it's Western civilization, but, but the church has often taken this thing on. So we've got these issues, these big, call them hot potatoes, call them whatever you like. We've got these big issues we must get serious about, them. we must nut them out, figure them out, and then we can tidy things up and put them in little jars. And with that in mind, we read um, the story of the little children coming to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you the story for the most part, but there's a, there's a nice little picture, I don't know which film it's from, possibly a Mormon one, I'm, I have no idea, but sometimes you capture these images and they just seem to, they just seem to get it. But when I think about this, and, and you can see it in various Gospels, but we're looking at Luke, when you see here in these sort of black and white words on a page, you, you can miss a lot. I think when the, when the children came to Jesus, I'd like, to, I'd like to get a picture in my head. I'd, I'd love to know what it smelt like. Maybe I don't. I'd like to know what it sounded like. I want to know how chaotic it was. I want to know who showed up and who interrupted. But we just get the black and white words on a page. But I think we need to try and grab hold of the fact that this was not clinical. This was not a... This is not a, a Bible college lecture where everyone sits quietly and this thing happens and Jesus says, oh, this is chaos and this is life. And people are bringing their kids and kids are running up to Jesus and probably interrupting, probably a lot like our kids. You can't tell a story start to finish because they're like, well, what about? But I, I reckon... And because life is serious and because there was a ministry, because there was really important work to be done. The disciples say, ah, 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 stop, just stop. Take the kids away. This is far too serious a moment in history for this to be happening. You just, you can't, you can't be doing this. We have this inkling, these are my words now, we have this inkling that this is the Messiah, the saviour of the world. He's coming to do vital history changing work this is eternal work get the kids away far too important this is far too serious and Jesus says if you want to pop that slide up Raph, Raph or Isaac whoever's on slides thanks for that let the children come to me let the children come to me even in this serious Messiah moment don't stop them for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I'm telling you the truth now, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Now, how do we hear this, this story normally? This story is told to kids. We love to tell this story to kids. We love to tell this story to show that Jesus is warm and compassionate. We love to tell it because we, we know and we acknowledge that children are really important in society. They're all great things and great reasons to tell the story, but they're not the reason he said it. The reason he said it was for you and me and every adult in the world and child to understand that unless you approach him in a childlike way, you are missing something. You haven't got it. And in our ever-increasing technological, serious, crisis-filled world, we're still instructed to do it. Approach him in a childlike way. I don't know, this is blowing my mind. It really is because I'm very ordered. I love to be, I love to be in control. I wake up in the morning and you ask any of the kids or Raph, I write a list and I love to tick things off. <laughs> and if I've done something and it wasn't on my list, I have to add it to my list so I can cross it up. I'm not alone, am I? I'm, I love to do things that are 
adult and organised. And you might, you might hear this story about being childlike and go, look, it's a great story, but remember what Paul said? Paul said, when I was a child, I acted like a child, I talked like a child, and when I was an adult, I moved away from childish things. Childish things, not childlike things. <sighs> if, I had a, if I was holding a mic, I'd drop it, Dave. <laughs> because both instructions are relevant. We're not called to be childish, we're called to be childlike. And the instruction is the same in a 21st century world. In a, in, a, in a world where a third of Pakistan is underwater, we are still called to be childlike and it's counterintuitive, is it not? Let's get serious. And no doubt there are serious moments, but there also have to be childlike moments. We think that it's all up to God or all up to me. That's sometimes how we approach this childlike thing. It's, it's not that either. It's, we, we tend to talk in absolutes, don't we? But, but this is us holding the hand of our Father God and saying we're doing this together and I'm the child. Don't need to take control of every single thing. Um, we've got three kids, as most of you know, and most of you don't know our youngest. Each child has brought something incredibly special into our family. You want to know a fact, you ask Isaac. You want, you want to talk creativity, you talk to Alyssa. You want to talk fun, you talk to Bay. So Bay was this fun-loving kid and we didn't actually know we were parents until we had Bay. So he was the kid who would run and parkour before anyone was parked. Well, they probably were parkouring, but he would jump off high things and he'd climb and do crazy stuff. And, and when we went to, I remember distinctly one day we went to the Waddle Festival, which was on last week, but we used to go years ago, and Raf got out this big fat black texter. I said, what are you doing? And he gets out Bay's like three-year-old arm and writes 0438. And we just knew this kid is going to run. This kid is going to run and play and be free. And he did everywhere he went. It was only when school hit that he started to get anxious because this is now it's serious. But he knew how to have fun. And one day I was putting washing on the line. We had this weird washing line that was next to a thing that you could climb. I'm not even going to bother explaining it. But of course, there was a thing to climb, so Bay climbed it. Now, he had this word for God that I've never heard anyone before or after say. He called him for a period of time, Goddy. So Goddy, in his mind, was funny and strong in that order. Funny and strong. Goddy is funny and strong. Now, the difference between God and Goddy, Goddy and Raph at that point was, you know, minute. So to this day, like today, you will find in Raph's Father's Day card um, the words, for example, how funny and strong you are. It still appears in every card. Goddy and Raph are funny and strong. And he just thought that fun was... That, that was the way to go. So anyways, climbing this thing, I'm putting washing on the line, I'm saying, you've got to get down. He's like, why? Because you'll fall, you might fall down. But what's the, you know, we, you know those conversations you have with kids where they're like, but I don't see the problem. I really don't see the problem because I'm having fun. And eventually I was tired of this conversation and I said, you might fall down, crack your head and die. <laughs> In a very childlike and wonderful way. And he turns to me and he goes, oh, then I get to meet Gotti. <laughs> You, you are frustratingly childlike and wonderful and, and difficult to parent. And you know, haven't we lost some of that just pure joy of being kids of a God who adores us? We're really called to it. And if you think we're not, have a think about how Jesus approached life when he was on earth. Was he a childlike follower of God? Absolutely he was. Three examples, three quick examples. First one, he knew his place, we read in John. The son can do nothing by himself, he said, of himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son does also. He knew that he was a child of his heavenly father. He knew his place despite being the saviour of the world. Secondly, he had a posture of thanksgiving. Do you know what? I meant to bring my Bible up. There it is. Here's one I prepared earlier. He had a posture of thanksgiving, which if you're following like a child, 
you tend to be thankful. Ah, oh, thanks for that. Breakfast, awesome. I mean, they probably don't thank us until they leave home if we're being really real. But, but there's this thankfulness that comes with this dependence on God. If you've got a Bible, turn to Matthew 11, 25 to 30. I think this kind of encapsulates the whole thing, really. So at that time, in verse 25, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things, the wisdom and the teaching, from the wise and learned, and revealed them to who? Not a rhetorical question. Revealed them to, to, to who? If you've got your Bible there. Little to little children. Darren, you get the gold star. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to be my boat. All things, I'm going to say it again, have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, to, and to those the Son chooses to reveal him. Then the verses that we read all the time in a serious and burdened world. Come to me, Jesus said, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I've never put those two things together. Maybe you have. Maybe, maybe you're a deeper theologian, theologian than me. But I have never attributed Jesus saying, you've revealed these truths to little children. And by the way, when you approach God in a childlike way, you can have less burdens. You can come to Jesus and you can say, I'm not in charge and I can rest knowing that I'm not the boss. I don't have to have everything worked out. I don't have to be the one who fixes everybody's problems. So he had a posture of thanksgiving. And thirdly, he lived in the moment. You don't see him fretting over the ministry he hasn't done yet. You don't see him looking up his, I don't, I'm not even going to try and say the year, his goals for the year. In fact, when people come up, Jesus, um, my son is really unwell. What does he do? I'll get to it. I'm, I'm, I'm here right now. He, he did his ministry. He lived in the moment. Didn't panic. Didn't worry about it. It's only 33 years. Is it going to be long enough? It's only three years of ministry. Will it be long enough to do everything I've been called to do? He just lived in the moment. Didn't panic. So what does this mean for you? And what does this mean for me? And what does this mean for Southern? So I think we can all accept that problems still need to be solved, that to-do lists still need to be written, thank goodness, that there is still, I love them, I really do love them. And, and there are things, there are ways we're called into this world to be organised and efficient and do the ministry we're called to do. Absolutely. There are still many of you who have to wake up in the morning and plan out other people's lives because they need you to. Those things aren't going away. But I just wonder what God might be saying to us in the midst of even that in the midst of keeping businesses alive, in the midst of how do we keep going in this not yet post-COVID world. But what is it that God might be saying? To Southern, I think there is a temptation for every church, every church to be planning and encouraging people, drawing people back in, reminding them of the need for rosters, making sure that we have lots of new programs, making sure that people understand that the service needs to be brilliant. I just wonder whether a childlike faith approaches that differently, takes the pressure off rather than putting the pressure on. I just wonder, I wonder what God is saying in that. And I wonder what God might be saying to each of us in the midst of what things we can't leave. But I do know this, being more serious won't help. I know that for sure. Getting more serious about it all actually won't help. And in Jesus' very counterintuitive, flip the coin over kind of way, I wonder if he's asking us to be more playful, 
more inquisitive and more trusting in how he's leading us individually and as a church. I don't know. I just, I just wonder what he's asking us to do. Um, I opened the service a few weeks ago and, um, and I'm going to read from this in a sec, but, but another section of the book, uh, this person, Mandy Smith, goes on sabbatical and she says, I drew up to God and I wanted a business meeting and he wanted a picnic. And I, I think there is something in that. And I'm going to read this and then unpack a, a couple of practical things and then we're going to finish. And we will finish on time. Yes. This is Mandy Smith. My first day of small things took place a week into my pastoral sabbatical, a radical eight weeks of nothing in a world running on everything. I was on my usual morning walk, a daily practice of taking the cap off my over full heart and mind so the contents could tumble out before God's kind eyes. What emerged on this particular March morning was so uh, uh, sorry, on this particular March morning, was obsessive wrangling with a troublesome situation that refused to be resolved. I've got those. For the thousandth time, I turned it over, willing it to take a more pleasing shape within my thinking so I could finally file it away. If this issue would just conform to my will, I could have the resolution I needed to enjoy this sabbatical. Something on the edge of my awareness drew me outside my own head just in time to spot a flock of geese over the treetops. Their wings beat a breath across all my mental spreadsheets, a breath that made my heart sigh and say, I want to fly like that. Long after they were gone, I stood there breathless from the sudden change in me. For the first time, I was aware that geese in formation have no plan to shape a V. Each goose doesn't me measure two inches between its beak and the tail of the goose in front. Instead, each goose attends to the art of sensing that slipstream sweet spot. The shoulders of a goose know how to find the space where the wind is kind. And without conscious effort, they are flying in a perfect V. A perfect V for a human to behold from beneath on a Tuesday morning. A perfect V to draw her out of her efforts of measuring the inches in front of her own nose in her own desperate efforts at V making. On that morning, my I want to fly like that heart sigh became a sea change. I had no idea yet how to fly like that but I had a feeling it would involve trusting parts of myself I'd ignored for a very long time. I wonder if you'll accept the challenge this morning to start having that sea change. Maybe you don't need it. Maybe you know how to play. Maybe you know how to be childlike. Maybe I'm only preaching to myself. But if that's the case, I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> I have a list because you have to have a list when you're Sally. And I, I just wonder if these things, pick one or pick your own, doesn't matter. But maybe the, these are some of the things we can do in, an, in a, I'm not, oh, I was about to say effort, but I don't mean effort. I mean in a genuine sense of wanting to be childlike, of being called back to that childlike relationship. So this week, here's a couple of five things. Just pick one or, or your own. Choose to pay attention to the small things that are calling for your attention. This week, I was sitting, tapping away at my keyboard with a long list, and I thought, how am I going to get all this done? And I turned just to my right, and outside our window, there was a bird with a long piece of straw in its beak. And he, just, he, he or she just stood there. Clearly, there is a nest to be built, my friend. Go and do it. But we just kind of looked at each other and engaged. And noticing that in that small moment, God actually said, you get your list done. Don't worry about your list. There'll be enough time. He wasn't in a rush. He or she, them, wasn't in a rush. It was just this beautiful moment of being called by the small things. Second one, choose to listen to your senses, your emotion, your instincts to engage in the world with your whole self. This, I think, is just for me, but feel free to jump on board. I try and push aside emotion. I try and push aside everything but logic. 
but I'm feeling and sensing that God is saying, no, no, engage with more than that. Where are your instincts? Where is your emotion? Let's lean in. Third one, take time away from your phone. Now I know that this is much easier said than done, particularly for those of you who need to be by your phone because someone could be trying to get in touch with you and you need to be there for that person. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, still own it and it's in a third drawer. So if you need to take time, if this is gonna be helpful and this is the one you wanna grab hold of, my suggestion would be that you give your phone to someone you really trust who will come and find you if need be. But get away from it if you can. Instead, sit, walk, pray, read, listen, play. Get out in nature, which I think was in almost, almost every person who shared this morning. Four, thank God for things you can't control. The air you breathe, the lungs you breathe with, the sun rising and setting, spring unfolding in tiny, tiny ways. Maybe just take notice of that. And then ask yourself this week, and this is, this is again one of Mandy Smith's thoughts, what might it be like every morning to open my eyes to a world already humming along and to wonder how to join in the humming? rather than waking up and saying, I need to take charge. I'm going to give you 30 seconds before I pray. And that 30 seconds is for you to actually, if you can, write down somewhere, phone, paper, mental if it needs to be. What will I do this week to attempt to be more childlike in front of my loving, gracious God? 30 seconds, then I'm going to pray.